application of tradition and authority can lead to legitimate prejudice. So when I was in Canada, I always thought why they have Queen's uh, picture on their bills, on their notes, currency notes. I asked them, why you carry this picture? We long, long ago, we have left this Queen. But you are, you are an independent country. But they say that this is a tradition. All these indicate that you are carrying Tripita and these two are, uh, two on the right side, are, uh, are exp expressing that well, you are reading Tripita. Interpretation of text can be in different way. We can see that in this pandemic also. We are living in the islands of awareness, floating, as they say, floating in the grand ocean of life, but disconnected from other selves. Phenomenology tried to create a philosophy which is pure and autonomous discipline, free from all presuppositions. In phenomenology, it says that the lived experience of the life world is the main concept, main tool to understand phenomenology. So, if you want to understand the human actions, you need to investigate what meaning they attach to the phenomena that they experience. I mean, what meaning I attach to this messy study table must be understood. This is four and this is three. Both are correct. But it, de it depends on the meaning they attached. The way we interacted uh, every day have some methods. Have you ever noticed that? Yes, I mean, ethnomethodologists say that we, we have method. We have different methods. So, say, for example, some, some people are pathological liar. They lie every time, every day. That's their method. Different methods can be applied to accomplish in, the, in our everyday life. And they want to delve into that method. If somebody takes away your cart and starts shopping on that cart, how do you feel? Then you can understand that it was my cart. It belonged to me, though I don't didn't behave like it, like I should I should have uh, with my own cart. That's breaching experiment. Perspective of the research subject to interpret how they see the world is important. Otherwise, you, you, don't, you won't be able to understand the reality properly. So we need to understand the meanings that people associate with the social world. And with that understanding of meaning, we can understand the society, the nature of the society. It sees reality as being constructed by people, unlike positivist sociology, which sees an objective reality out there. As I said, it's not out there. It's not external. It is constructed by people. We need to understand the reality by putting our shoes in it. On the left side, you will find one form of happiness, one form of ecstasy. And in the right, on the right, you find another form. So, without any comparison, we need to know how the actors put meaning to their social words. Thank you, everybody, for joining to this lecture. Thank you so much, everybody.
गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी एम आई ऑडिबल टू एवरी वन आई थिंक आई एम ऑडिबल सो टूडे इज आवर थर्ड एंड फाइनल डे ऑफ द लेक्चर सीरीज ऑन द बिगिनिंग ऑफ सोशल साइंस एंड साइंटिफिक मेथड प्रेजेंटेड बाय कोलकाता स्टडी सर्कल सो आई होप यू हैव एंजॉय द प्रीवियस लेक्चर हेल्ड ऑन दी थर्ड एंड फोर्थ ऑफ जुलाई आई होप दिस लेक्चर सीरीज इज हेल्पिंग यू टू एनलाइटन योर सेल्फ anyway i must say we are streaming live on youtube so if you get disconnected you can watch it on youtube my co-host will provide the link in the chat box if you have any questions pertaining to the lecture please type it down in our chat box and those who will be watching on youtube you can type your questions in the live chat box we will convey your questions to our professor during the q and a session I would like to thank all of you for participating and supporting us. We have an announcement at the end of the lecture, so please stay tuned. Now, without wasting any time, I would like to request our respected professor Shubhrato Shankar Bagchi, the Ambedkar Chair Professor of the Department of Anthropology, University of Calcutta, to deliver the final lecture of this lecture series. So, sir, please let's start. uh thank you pushpita for the introduction good evening to everybody um this is the last lecture of this second series uh we hope to continue such um, lecture series in future also uh um uh, but well uh, having said that uh, i must uh, emphasize that uh, i need all of your support uh that uh, we have already got from you uh for continuation of such a kind of uh, academic discourse that we are doing right now now i have uh, shared the screen i hope it is visible to everybody let me just make it up the screen Uh, well uh well uh, as i said that this is the third lecture of the uh, final lecture of this series beginning of social sciences and scientific method now i'm not going to recapitulate because uh, it has those who are uh, waiting uh, here have seen twice the snippets of the previous lecture so uh, actually uh, we have discussed positivistic social science and uh, interpretive interpretive interpretivist social science in the previous lectures today i am very briefly i would like to uh, discuss critical social science uh, it also i mean we have emphasized on two two uh, sort of uh, prominent um, views prominent traditions of uh, philosophy uh, that is rationalism and empiricism empiricism are uh, the empiricists gave rise to positivism the rationalists or the kantian philosophy to some extent gave rise to interpretivism but we left a very important character or very important uh, master rather uh, in social science who is which is karl marx now critical social science is uh, actually has roots in karl marx but it it went farther i mean uh, all of them are not hardcore marxists some of them are marxologists i mean there is a difference between marxist and marxologists those who think that uh, marxists are those, those who think that the society can be changed marxologists say that marx is marx marx was an excellent social scientist his theories can be used uh, in explaining uh, social phenomena uh, not necessarily changing the world so these are the things that are there so critical social science uh mostly composed of marxist 
Marxologists and leftists. So here uh, it's, it, 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 has a, it has it has it has its, its roots in dialectical materialism, class analysis, and critical structuralism. Uh, this trend, this tradition, mixes nomothetic, that is the objective uh, approach, and ideographic, that is the subjective approaches. Uh, writings of Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud both actually uh, have had defining influences on this tradition. Then we have Adorno, from Marcuse, uh, Habermas, all of them are uh, somehow touched, have, uh, somehow related with uh, uh, critical social sciences. Uh, now, the purpose of social science, as, as far as this tradition is concerned, is to reveal what is hidden to liberate and empower people. I mean, there are so many things hidden in our social phenomena. We'll have to unearth those hidden phenomena so that we can liberate and empower people. We take something, some relationship, say for example, relationship between master and a subject is for taken for granted. We take this relationship taken for granted, but there are hidden, hidden messages of oppression there. We need to unearth those hidden messages, those hidden uh, information, those hidden actions. Uh, to liberate and empower people. The, the aim is to liberate and empower people. Social reality has multiple layers. It doesn't have one layer. I mean, uh, when, we are, when, when we are discussing the interpretative social science, we said that the, the, the meaning has multiple layers. And uh, with each passing layer, there are problems of misunderstanding, so they for the for, for the very from the very beginning they uh, they actually said that social reality has multiple layers, and we have to uh, we'll we'll have to uh, un, uh, unravel those layers to understand the real motive of the social phenomena, and with that we can liberate and empower people. Now, people have unrealized potential and are misled by reification. I mean, that's a term that critical social scientists say. What does it mean? First thing is that people have unrealized, um, unrealized potential. We don't know our potentials. We always take, for take something for granted that, well, uh, I am born with a subjugation and this is my fate. To, uh, to, to, to get subjugated through, throughout our life. Our forefathers were also subjugated. So I don't have that potential to liberate myself, to emancipate from, the, uh, from this subjugation. So we don't, they don't understand the unrealized potential, uh, the, the, the true potential, true potential within them. So, and they're misled by reification. Reification is basically, uh, is a term used by the critical social scientists to explain, describe, and criticize various forms of systematic processes of commodification. We have commodified various things. And in this commodification, we have so many layers and we don't understand the true potential of those, uh, um, our true potential to unravel those uh, layers. And with that, uh, we tend to mislead ourselves. So commodification, exploitation, and domination, these are the three uh, things uh, that are there. I mean, to describe reification, through reification, they can describe, explain, describe, and criticize various forms of systematic processes of commodification. 
exploitation and domination that lead to a loss of community that is anomie meaning disenchantment and freedom uh, that is domination i mean uh, these commodification exploitation and domination always to put always put gloss always put layers on anomy that is unrest towards this uh, towards um, um, towards gaining freedom and disenchantment doesn't i mean with that commodification uh, or uh, exploitation or domination you don't get disenchanted so you think it is a kind of fate that we are born with we will have to live with this fate throughout our life that's reification for you but there was a uh, it ascribes blame of alienation to the system it it alienates you i mean uh, you get alienated from commodities you get uh, alienated from your own uh, own demands your own legitimate demands uh, but you don't seem to understand through through reification uh, society puts a gloss on everything and actually try to project that this is the thing that you will have to accept so reification is a very important term for uh, for the critical social scientists but uh, and it of course uh, it's a true reification uh, it means that the object is really a subject many i mean in postmodernism you will find that there was a, the, the difference between object and subject has been blurred but here they say the object is a subject i will come back to this point later let me read these things then i will go uh, to the illustration uh, the but the mm, the uh, criticism against the uh, against this reification is that it denies what it affirms that the world is inhuman it affirms that world is inhuman but it denies that at the same time and affirms what it denies that namely that there will there uh, there still a subject that can act and change the world so here you are what is it the mangal sutra okay let us let us put it in uh, critical social science perspective now uh, of course if this object is a subject meaning that this is not only an object uh it is commodified commodified uh it's a means of commodity uh, it's a means towards commodification exploitation and domination then well uh through marriage uh, a lady can get it um, so this object is a subject but once you say that this object is a subject critics believe that you are denying what you are affirming i mean when you are saying that the the, the, the world is inhuman but you have personalized or you have humanized mangal sutra so your basic contention becomes denied and you have found that this object is a source of commodification exploitation and domination if it if it is so then you are you are affirming what you have denied you are affirming that there is a subject who can actually be a person and who can wear this thing very with, with with much pleasure with much satisfaction so you are denying that inhuman world so you are 
denying what you are affirming and you are affirming what you are denying. So that's the, that's the criticism against reification. It's a big, big debate. We can go on with this debate on reification. Uh, and of course, another very important issue is praxis. So in critical social science, in the, in the purpose of social science is to reveal, oh, sorry, multiple layers. Uh, sorry, it's a kind of, yeah, the social science is irrational. Just read the, the from that part. Social science is rational. There was a mistake in PowerPoint display. Uh, social science is rational. Social life is rational. Uh, they say that th th there is no irrationality in social life. And a bounded autonomy stance, stance is taken toward human agency. So human agency have autonomy. They think that they have autonomy, but it's a bounded autonomy. The autonomy as long uh, autonomy is there as long as the ruling class allows this is the bounded autonomy and social scientific knowledge is imperfect but can fight false consciousness scientific knowledge is not perfect always it says you can see the scientific knowledge there but it can fight false consciousness there is a there is an element of uh, uh, confirmation through scientific knowledge that it can fight false consciousness. Of course, through CAA, CSS, we, uh, they create abduction as explanatory, explanatory uh, critics. Abduction is used to create explanatory critics. I'll come to abduction point that that's a conclusion, uh, database conclusion that we call uh, there are, uh, you can see from the uh, figure that uh, there, there are three uh, main planks of uh, any research, abduction, deduction, and induction. In abduction, you have uh, creativity. Through creativity, you can, have, I mean, from data, uh, you go to new theory, and it's, it's a creative uh, uh, sort of, uh, creative sort of, hypothesis that you can uh, bring. Then you have deduction from the theory to you go to data and induction is from once again, um, from data to theory. Uh, these induction and deduction are strict, strictly scientific nature. In, uh, in anthropology, sociology and other social sciences, we add, particularly in critical social sciences, we add this abduction which is creativity. Creatively, see what, uh, what creatively explain the um, social phenomena. Explanations are verified through praxis, that is practical knowledge. All evidence in, is theory dependent and some theories reveal deeper type of evidences. So theory, all evidences are theory dependent. I mean, all evidences are dependent on theory and some theories reveal deeper types of evidences, some others not so deep. It's a kind of reflexive dialectic orientation which is adopted through knowledge that is used from a transformative perspective. That's, that's, a, that's a complicated line. First thing is that Reflexive dialectic orientation. It is reflexive as, as well as dialectic. Uh, what's uh, what for the reflexive dialectic orientation to orient to towards knowledge? We are taking the knowledge. We are not taking the knowledge uh, as granted. We are taking the knowledge in a reflexive mode and in a dialectic matter pattern. So uh, this reflexive dialectic pattern can use as a transformative perspective, that is to liberate people, to emancipate people. That's the meaning of this transformative perspective. So social reality and the study of the necessary, study of it necessarily contain a moral political dimension. So we 
cannot get away with this moral political dimension as far as the critical social scientists are concerned. Social reality and the study of it has a moral political dimension. We, we, sometimes we study things with no moral ground, with no political ground. Sometimes people, even the social scientists say, that I am apolitical. That's the, uh, uh, people say, uh, this statement is either too political or rather uh, uh, it's very much political statement, apolitical, or they don't know, they, they don't understand what the politics is. I mean, you cannot really explain a social reality. Say, for example, the condition of the migrant labor uh, in India now. Can you explain it with the, without moral political dimension? No, it's not possible. And the moral po political positions are unequal in advancing human freedom and empowerment. That's very important. I mean, I mean this moral political positions are unequal. I mean, we take this moral political po po positions, which are unequal uh, in advancing um, human freedom and empowerment. Some will lead to human empower, human uh, freedom and empowerment. Some others may not. So it has a kind of unequal position. Now let us come back. Uh, let us go to the feminist social science. Uh, feminist research is conducted by people, most of them women, who hold a feminist self-identity and consciously use a feminist perspective. They use multiple research techniques, attempt to give a voice to women and work to correct the predominant male-oriented perspective. It's always the, the effort for the feminist research or feminist social science is to give voice to women and to work to correct the predominant male-oriented perspective. We have predominant male-oriented perspective in everywhere. You know, uh, Laka used to uh, give a Friday lecture. Uh, in each on each Friday, there was a lecture in the um, uh, university uh, where uh, every, people from all, all walks of life used to attend. In one such uh, uh, lecture, he wrote that, uh, he wrote it in uh, French, it means women don't exist. And women are not whole. These two things. So it was a kind of uh, earthquake there in the lecture room. What he's talking about, but what he thinks that he's saying. Laka then said that well, you, you can see the our language is also male oriented. I mean, um, we don't have a proper um, term to describe women. We say that well, man, woman. The divide of manhood makes a woman. Devoid of manhood is womanhood. Male, female. Devoid de 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 of or absence of male, malehood, maleness, leading to femaleness, femininity. You, we still say uh, uh, effeminate males, we still, re still ridicule them. So it's always there. Our, own language is very much male oriented. So they always try to give voice to women and walk to correct the uh, predominant male oriented perspective. There you are. Mm. So advocacy of feminist value position and perspective that was there. That is always there in feminist uh, social sciences. Rejection of sexism in assumptions, concepts, and research questions. So we have sexism 
embedded in our assumptions, concepts, and research questions, they reject everything. Creation of empathic connection between connections between researcher and those he or she studies. It's always uh, uh, um, it, 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 it owes heavily with interpretative social sciences. So uh, there is a kind of empathic relation between researcher and those he or she studies. It, it really try to create sensitivity to how relations of gender and power permit all spheres of social life everywhere, all spheres of social life uh, has got gender and power relationship. Mm, it, it tried to create sensitivity. And with that sensitivity, they hope to ameliorate the situation. Now, incorporation of researchers' personal feelings and experiences into the research process. So it's very much there. Incorporate your, your personal feeling while writing your research product, research uh, output, uh, feelings and experiences. So once again, it is it owes heavily, uh, or, or uh, it has a kind of uh, very uh, close uh, relationship with the interpretive social sciences. It incorporates researchers' personal feeling and experiences in the research process. Flexibility in choosing research techniques and crossing boundaries between academic fields. So it, 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 it crosses floors. I mean, um, sociologists or uh, historians come to, the, uh, come to the field of anthropology to understand uh, the empathy, to understand the empathic relation of the research, how to, how to incorporate empathic uh, accounts of the researchers. Um, in the, into the research process. So it crosses boundaries between academic fields, recognition of emotional and mutual dependence dimension in human experience. So human experience is always laden with uh, emotional and mutual dependence. So these dimensions are uh, not always well emphasized in our social sciences, particularly as far as women are concerned. We don't attach much importance to the uh, emotional and mutual dependence uh, of the women among the women and uh, uh, um, uh, women with the other members of the family or society. So it tries to recognize those emotional and mutual dependence. And action oriented research that seeks to facilitate personal and societal change. And the, the picture that I have uploaded here actually is a picture of a group of women working as a part of NREGS, NRE, NREG scheme, uh, the, the, the Employment Guarantee Scheme. You can see the kind of work that are there in NREGS is not actually uh, very suitable for the women. So uh, they, they don't have that kind of sensitivity to, to frame NREGS in such a way that women can have equal share or women can really feel comfortable with this kind of job, this kind of works. So there was a huge cry against the NREGS schemes which are mainly uh, um, male-dominated works. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, it's very, very hard for, 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 for women to do these kinds of jobs. So it is a deterrent. The plan is itself a deterrent for the women to participate in energies. So it's a very small example how we uh, go about, go to planning, Go, uh, I mean, how we frame our uh, programs, plans and programs, development programs. And this is, this energy is going to be the mm, main 
men living, men survival, men threat of survival, threat of survival, threat of survival for crores of people in coming years due to this COVID situation. Then we go to postmodern science, social science very briefly. Uh, postmodern research is a part of larger postmodern mo movement that includes art, music, literature, and crit uh, cultural criticism. Roots in the philosophies, roots in the philosophies of existentialism, nihilism, anarchism, and the ideas of Mar uh, Heide Heidegger, Foucault, Nietzsche, Jean-Paul Sartre, Wittgenstein. All these people, all the works of these people create a, a, a help to create a movement that is postmodern movement, postmodern research, postmodern social science is part of that movement, which includes art, music, literature, and cultural criticism. Postmodernism is a rejection of modernism. And what is modernism? That's important. I mean, we talk about modernism, postmodernism, we seldom talk about postmodernism, what they're rejecting. That's important. Postmodernism, modernism refers to basic assumptions, beliefs, and values that arose in the Enlightenment era. So the Enlightenment era values, mostly positivism, uh, uh, mostly the logical positivists and other empiricists really, uh, really, uh, reign the uh, scenario of the Enlightenment era. They, they, uh, this is these are modernism. I talked about Descartes. Descartes is the beginning of modernism. Doubt everything, and if you doubt everything, you can only come to conclusion that you exist, cogito ergo sum. Modernism relies on logical reasoning, as I said. It is optimistic about the future and believes in progress. It has confidence in technology and science, and it embraces human values. That is, judging ideas based on their effect on human welfare. So modernism actually, the, these are the planks, these are the main uh, planks of modernism. Uh, they, they are optimistic about the future, believes in progress, and it includes the progress of society. They think that um, culture, culture evolved throughout the, through the time, uh, through, uh, and, um, uh, through the ages. Uh, it has confidence in technology and science, and it embraces humanistic humanist values, which is based on mm, uh, human welfare. So, modernism holds that most people can agree about standards of beauty, truth, and modernity. So, Indians, uh, Indian people are very fond of fair skins. Uh, the, the debate is raging there. The debate is going on on fair and lovely or uh, something else and lovely. So uh, there can be standards of beauty, truth, and morality. And uh, people can agree on this standard. So modernism says that, here you are, you can, we, can, we can agree, we can agree, uh, generally agree on the standards of beauty, or maybe truth, or maybe morality. Postmodernism rejects everything that are written in this slide. Rejection of all ideologies and organized belief systems, including all formal social theory. They reject everything, all ideologies, be it uh, any idealistic ideology or materialistic ideology, anything, anything. They, reject. There is no such thing as ideology or organized belief system. Organized belief system 
<coughs> some of the postmodernists says organized mafia. They create mafiosi. Uh, it, it includes Christianity. It includes other religions also. So, and they reject formal social theory. They say there is no such thing that can explain social phenomena in a generalized way. So formal social theories are rejected. Strong reliance on intuition, imagination, personal experience, and emotion. These are the basic things of postmodernism. Uh, intuition, imagination, personal experience, emotion, they try to catch hold of this. They, they try to grasp this. Sense of meaninglessness and pessimism. So meaninglessness and pessimism is inherent in postmodernism. They, they think that everything is meaningless and they are pessimistic, inherently pessimistic. Believe that world will never improve. That's important. They say that a kind of this is the, we are living in a world which can never improve. And sometimes we say that go, um, we talk about golden past. They, they say that there is no such thing as golden past. Society was ruthless, brute from the very beginning, and it is still continuing. It will continue in the past in future. Extreme subjectivity in which there is no distinction between mental and external world. So, as I said, the reality is not external according to interpretative social science. Uh, so, one thing, that's one thing. Positivistic social science there, it's reality is external. So, they say that there is no distinction between mental and external worlds. Everything is external. One thing can be called external. It is due to our internal belief that there is a, that is getting external. That's important. You can see from this GIF uh, that well, uh, uh, this is a kind of this is this is a snippet from a postmodern film by Bob Thriller. Mm. Women are colorful. Well, of course. So the film was created in such a way that uh, women are colorful uh, and uh, every, except women or this woman, everything is black and white. So women, that, that woman is going around hoping that it's a very good world. It's a very... It's a very optimistic world, but it's actually not. The black and white scenario, even his possibly half fiance, uh, is in black and white. So we can uh, live in a mental state where we can think that the, the, uh, we are living in an opt we are living in a good world, we have a good future, but we are actually not. You can you can dance, you can go around anywhere, uh, but people the, the world won't improve, world won't change. It's a kind of ardent. Some some people say uh, paralyzing relativism, in which there are infinite, infinite interpretations, non superior to other. So. One aspect has got infinite interpretation, non superior to other. Non superior to other is okay, but in fi having infinite interpretation makes you kind of paralytic in explaining social phenomena. That's important. That's that's really uh, the problem of postmodernism. Espousal of diversity, chaos, and Complexity that is constantly changing. So they espouse uh, diversity, chaos, complexity. We are, and of course, that's constantly changing. The nature of 
diversity, nature of chaos, nature of complexity, all, all, always changing. They reject starting the past or different places because only the here and now is relevant. So postmodernism is not diachronic, it's synchronic. Only, only now and here is important. I mean, that's important. That's the uh, pitfall, the biggest pitfall of postmodernism. Belief that causality cannot be studied because life is too complex and rapidly changing. They feel that you cannot really have causal relationship, uh, cause and effect relationship of any social phenomena. You cannot study that because life is very complex and rapidly changing. As you study the uh, causality, it, it, has, it, it, has, it, it is changing. So you cannot really uh, study a particular social phenomena. You cannot really stop a particular social phenomenon and study that. While you study, it is changing. Assertion that research can never truly represent what occurs in the social world. You can do in n number of researches, but you cannot. That cannot re represent but occurs in the social world. So since there is no causality, it, they don't believe in causality, they, they say that, well, uh, social research doesn't mean anything. Uh, it cannot represent what occurs in the social world. Now let us talk about very briefly once again, how the uh, different subjects within social science part it away, part it away from each other. I'm leaving anthropology and sociology for this part. I mean, this is a much debated and we know somehow we know how anthropology uh, was, uh, was evolved, sociology was the uh, uh, main subject, mother subject of this, uh, all these social sciences. So I'm leaving this anthropology, sociology debate here. It's a, it may be, we may have a separate talk on anthropology, sociology. That's important, but well, I'm leaving this. I'm only dealing with the less known parting ways. One, number one, economics. When, how it parted and how it shaped with this partition. Economics soon began to go its own way at the very outset of enlightenment with the German historical school of economics, that is decline of German historical school of economics, that is romantic economy, romantic school of economics, it developed a, say, as a separate discipline. Economic knowledge is a considerable extent, uh, is to a considerable extent cumulative. Economics started to believe that it's a cumulative knowledge that they should, they should uh, work on. It's not always historical knowledge. It, it's not actually the individual, uh, the, 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 the individual that is important. That's a cumulative knowledge. Theories are developed and tested against models and their assumptions. That's the way economics started to work. Theories are developed and then tested against models and their assumptions. They started to do this work over and over again. And economics uh, have their own way of doing this. It all started with Adam Smith, though. That's very old Adam Smith, father of modern economics, division of labor, invisible hand, individual effort, is the producer of the, he said that individual hand, individual effort is the producer of social good. That's the beginning of economics. But, well, it all started with, uh, I mean, uh, the, the actual um, economics started with classical political economy. Mm -hmm. 
Jeremy Bentham, Reverend Thomas Malthus, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill. They examined the ways the landed capitalist and laboring classes produced and distributed national output and modeled the efforts of population and international trade. That was their topic, that was their subject. How the landed capitalist and laboring classes produced and distributed national output and modeled the effects of population and international, uh, international trades. This, this is the classical political economy for you. Then, of course, capitalism and Karl Marx, capital, thus, capital, capital, communist manifesto, thus, capital, history of class struggle, Hegelian dialectics, every, everything was there, another trend. Those are sort of simultaneous trends sometimes. Neoclassical thought, it appeared uh, just before the Second World War, marginal utility, application, and development of Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism, uh, then mathematical analysis, Austrian school, Irving Fisher, I'm just listing this. Alfred Marshall, Joseph Schumpeter. This group said the determination of price outputs income distribution in the market through supply and demand. Uh, state doesn't have anything to do uh, uh, with the uh, income and distribution of income. It must be uh, done through markets. So prices, outputs, ev and income, everything will be decided by market. This is the neoclassical uh, uh, economic, economic thought. That is, uh, that is a different from the classical thought like the, well, that is um, uh, Adams, Smith, or Marx has had espoused or Marx had actually proposed. Then uh, during the, uh, the 30s, uh, uh, there was depression and reconstruction that gave rise to another form of economic uh, tradition, uh, Hayek, Keynes, we are talking about Keynes these days, uh, uh, where, where Keynes actually emphasized that uh, we need to have a very vibrant public sector to, for the welfare of the people. Government should invest more in the public sector. And that's the biggest uh, sort of employment generating uh, sector biggest income generating sector, biggest asset generating sector. But nobody believes uh, in Keynes these days. None of these ruling elites believe, I, I, I guess. Uh, that's obvious that we need a good public sector, but these days we see the how to sell the public, that there is a competition on selling the public sector. Then Wall Street crash, on that crash, on the background of that crash, can save that. Market can crash, people can uh, become uh, pauper or penniless overnight. You can have calamities in our societies. So public sector is important. That's the, that's the um column that's the main column of main stay main stay of economies that should be and the rise of then world war ii happened and rise of uh, Bretton Woods institutions like world bank imf etc that's another sort of economics that's that are there uh, and we have american way of you know, dealing things uh, where uh, after Second World War, in the uh, United States have become the pre preeminent global economic power. Euro Europe, Japan, and Soviet Union lay in ruins, and the British Empire was, as it said, Joel uh, Galbraith, Samuelson, Arrow, all these people said that America will be the only force that are there. And it will be a unipolar society. And uh, America will actually decide how the economy will run. That's American way. 
then monetarianism monetarianism and uh, chicago school uh, that's the lesser fair we have neoclassical economy and this is the lesser fair economy ronald coase milton friedman the fed uh, the, the 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 paul volcker greenspan all of them this is this is uh, uh, we, uh, uh, this is the interventionist monetary and fiscal policy policies that the orthodox post-war economics recommended come under attack in a, by a particularly particular group by a particular by a group theorists working in the University of Chicago, which came as a Chicago School of Economics. We talked about Chicago School of Sociology. We talked about Chicago School of uh, Architecture. Now you are now here. You are the Chicago School of Economics. Uh, and also we have welfare economics by Amartya Sen Stiglitz. That's the way economics actually parted its wells and proliferated as a separate social science. Now let us talk about psychology. The first psychological laboratory was uh, initiated in uh, Leipzig, Leipzig by Wundt. Wilhelm Wundt, um, but the first psychometric analysis was done by Francis Galton in his book, Hereditary Genius in 19, 1869. Uh, the focus of psychology become the behavior and experience of the individual aftermath of positivism. That's important. Aftermath of positivism, um, positivism doesn't really uh, allow people to, uh, to be very individualistic. The individual is not so important. It's the collectivity that is important. So after positivism, after positivism, psychology started to focus on individual behavior, individual experience. And the general aim was to explain, predict, control this individual behavior and individual experience. Uh, that's the identifying feature of psychology. And the, they, they, they parted away from positivism. And when they parted away from positivism, it's a separate social science. Psychoanalysis was initiated, you know all this, uh, by Freud, and psychometrics was Gal by Galton. Beware of Freudian slips. Slip of tongue is the uh, best way to understand human uh, behavior. So when you uh, are very beware of Freudian slips, you don't know what you are storing within your mind. Something analogous to other sciences, formulation of hypothesis that can be tested against objective empirical data, ideally by experience, experiments in which relevant variables can be manipulated and extraneous ones controlled. Uh, these are the uh, definition of variables. Uh, I mean, the relevant variables can be manipulated. We can manipulate the variables and extraneous variable, sir, Controlled. We'll talk about these variables maybe in some other lecture series. We don't have much time the, here, uh, but the 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 they formulate hypothesis, which can be which is tested against objective empirical data, and we have uh, manipulated uh, or controlled uh, by manipulated so program program group or control. Uh, I mean uh, relevant variables. Manipulated and extraneous ones controlled. Other social studies, such as history or anthropology, can really experiment. Sociology also can really experiment with people. When you are uh, manipulating the relevant behaviors, the relevant variables, you are experiment with, experiment with the human behavior. And we, uh, the, the other social science, science or other social scientists do not do that. That's the difference between psychology and other social sciences. Now, let us talk about history 
एट द एंड ऑफ नाइनटीन सेंचुरी डील थे एंड विंडल बॉन्ड रिक राइकर्ड एंड बेनेडेटो बेनेडेटो क्रॉस क्रॉस से स्टार्टेड सॉरी स्टार्टेड अ काइंड ऑफ ट्रेडिशन व्हिच लेड टू हिस्ट्री हिस्ट्री वाज कंसर्न विथ यूनिक इवेंट्स लिविंग द एस्टेब्लिशमेंट ऑफ जनरल लॉज टू सोशल साइंसेस सो व्हेन वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट से फॉर एग्जांपल मुगल हिस्ट्री दे 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 ट्राई टू concentrate on unique events not the general laws they leave general laws to the other social sciences so where uh, uh, other social sciences like anthropology sociology will study the general laws of general laws of society but they are dealing unique events that's the beginning of history history didn't Uh, his history really was not confined to this uh, this notion uh, but well that's the beginning of history historians try to understand the past from within while social scientists other social scientists attempted to explain from outside that's that's the historical history historians view i mean they try to understand the past from within they they, they journey to that path say for example the path that is that is there uh, the historical fact the historical character traversed and started to narrate that path started to narrate the his actions as an insider but social scientists try to explain that path from outside mostly mostly uh history his professor of history uh tried to negotiate his cat uh, so history actually rebelled with the con con uh, conventional wisdom uh some parts of history his marxist historian like romain sereni they started to talk about historical materialism we uh, we um, discussed about historical materialism now economic historians uh, like uh, in the um, um, uh, they started to um, publish this uh, economic history review belgian henry pierne and hex hexer more in common with the debates among economists than with those of the fellow historians so they are, they they debated with the economist more than the fellow historians so they are, more of a economic who are, who are having historical historian view historians view rather than historians with economics uh, their views on economics no uh, the in france an old school i talked about an old school a broader as uh, uh, approach to history uh, it started with an old journals journal lucien febre bloch and fed uh, brodel uh, it, it, it's a kind of exploration of what author called geo history a historical geography now there are new approaches of the of, of past it started from uh, late 60s to uh, late 70s one is history history from below which which we call subaltern history sometimes uh, not only the history of ordinary people in the past but also history written from the point of view of the ordinary people so during the say for example in the uh, uh, mughal era why mughal empire declined one such um, uh, one such uh, argument was by the sir walter history is that uh, so the taxes were taxes on uh, agriculture was so high and most agriculturists were actually left agriculture so the revenue from agriculture declined and that's why uh, the decadence or the decline of the mughal empire started that's one way of seeing history from below then we have 
Microstoria, that is microstory. It's a very good example is um, Ginsburg, Cheese and Worms, Laudier, uh, Montelu, then we have Ackenfield, all of them. It's basically passed at the level of small community, whether village, street, family, or even individual. An ex explanation of faces in the crowd that allows concrete experience to re-enter social history. That's important. I mean, each village has a history. Each small community has a history. We tend to forget that. Uh, Ethno-historians actually look at the history of the small communities, street, family, one cafe, one individual has history. So these are the examination of the faces of the crowd. And it allows concrete experience to re-enter social history. So the concrete experiences of a street, say for example, will re-enter into the social history. It's the history of that street. Then we have history of the everyday. Altak, I can't uh, pronounce properly. Altak something like that. Uh, developed in Germany, of course. Uh, who, uh, who else uh, can um, give such a short name for a big thing? Uh, developed in Germany, drawing on philosophical and sociological tradition of the, that includes Schulz, Goffman, Lefebvre, and Chartier. It reinserted human experience into social history, which was uh, perceived by some of the practitioners as becoming increasingly abstract and faceless. So, history becomes a uh, Social history becomes faceless. When, we, when I was talking about the decline of Mughal Empire, it's faceless. So they tried to give uh, a new dimension of this faceless history with human experience. Emphasized on triviality and ignored politics. That's important. They, they, they emphasized on triviality and ignored politics. Here you are. They emphasized on triviality. If, the, if you don't tend to emphasize the triviality, you can walk like that. And uh, of course, they ignored politics. Now, another very important trend in history, which is the last one I will discuss, uh, Historia del Lemaginaire or history of mentalities. That's important. And uh, everyday version of intellectual history or the history of ideas. Every day we create history. With the, we don't know. We don't know that we create history with the history of ideas. We have several ideas. But we don't understand that. I'll talk about this imagined community. Uh, history of habits of thought or unspoken assumptions. This group tried to try to grasp the history of history of habits of thoughts of unspoken assumptions. Originated in France in the 1920s and 1930s, revived with the increasing concern with representation. Who represent what? And problem, I mean, who will speak for whom? And with following Jean, uh, Jacques Lacan and Foucault called imaginaire, which is best translated as imagined rather than imaginary. A new emphasis on the construction of social production of different forms of culture. This group led a new emphasis on the construction of social production of different forms of culture, or the invention of tradition, or the states and societies as imagined communities. 
as Benedict Anderson said, the imagined nation is an imagined community. So here you are, the, the, the patriotism. So well, uh, there are two, two, uh, pot, two pots with, 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 with uh, trees. One is saying that, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm so glad that I was born in this pot and not in that pot. You can, you can relate this form of patriotism in these days. These days you can relate these things uh, with a kind of scenario or other imaginary narratives that are developed in India. But nation is an imagined community. We don't know any people, many people in the world. I mean, how many people in this in this uh, in in India we know, but we consider ourselves as well as a person in Meghalaya or maybe in Kerala or um, Tamil Nadu or UP, same in the same community that we are Indians. So it's an imagined community. This history of mentalities. The, the is uh, can 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 really uh, explain such a concern, such a form of representation. That's very history from outside, history from inside. All four approaches are linked in some ways to social anthropology. All four actually try to grasp, try to grapple with the natives point of view. Work in small communities, observing everyday life and studying modes of thought or belief systems, describe themselves as historical anthropologists. So they, uh, as I said, the political, uh, econo uh, historical, uh, economic historians are different. And here you are, the historical uh, anthropologists are there. Uh, they refer works to um, people preacher Turner, or sometimes even to Clifford Kears, who is ahistorical in every sense of term. Now let us go to the different approaches of research. Uh, we talked about scientific method, rise of scientific method. We talked about different ways this method developed. Now we talk about how this method created approaches. First one is qualitative approach. The constructivist and interpretivist uh, view is generally associated with qualitative, appro qualitative approach to science. I mean, this is not positivism that we're talking about in qualitative approach. It's the interpretivist view that we talk about in qualitative approach. Uh, that, that means observation are made through unstructured interviews of participatory observation. The researcher becomes part of a group to observe it. The data are obtained from one or just a few research subjects. The data are analyzed qualitatively by interpreting texts and recorded materials. That's a qualitative research for you. And quantitative research is the objectivist, positivist view is associated with the quanti quantitative research methods. Uh, observations are collected that can be counted, measured, so that data can be aggregated over many research subjects. The subjects are intended to represent a much larger group, possibly in support of of a universal explanation. They always try to generalize the things. The data are analyzed using quantitative and statistical techniques. Both approaches have their advantages and drawbacks. For some research questions, a qualitative approach is better. In other cases, a quantitative approach is more appropriate. We always see that. In, in fact, a mixed approach where both methods are used to complement each other is steadily gaining popularity these days. 
Now, la my last topic is goals of research. How you define your goals of research? That's important because according to your goals of research, nature of your research will also differ. Now, let us first say what can be the general goal. General goal, general goal is to gain knowledge. Specific goals can differ. Differ on the type of knowledge that we want to gain and for what purpose we want to gain. If, 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 we, if we want to gain the knowledge for applications, that's a separate sort of research. If you want to gain uh, knowledge for knowledge sake, that's, a, that's another form of research, okay? Now, the first debate is universalistic versus particularistic. Universalistic and particularistic trend. Universalistic trend is to provide explanation that apply generally. Applicable to all people or all groups of societies. That is universalistic. Say for example, violent video, we, uh, we sometimes uh, say that there is a a relationship between watching violent video games and aggressive behavior of the kids. Uh, we take, uh, we, 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 can, um, we, we want to make an, a kind of universalistic statement by uh, doing a research, uh, taking gender, age, cultural, cultural setting and concern. And after everything, we say, we actually uh, try to uh, make an universalistic, make a universalistic statement that well, violent game watching uh, leads to aggressive behavior of the kids. But particularistic research is aimed at describing or explaining a phenomenon that occurs in a specific setting or concerns of a specific group. It's basically particular to a specific group. It must describe or explain a phenomenon in terms of that specific setting or concerns of the specific group. Say for example, if we, if, we, if we state, if we make a statement or if we try to research, do a research on how Bengali males take or Bengali males, whether Bengali males accept independent women or opinionated women, well, the statement, if the statement is, is the hypothesis is that Bengali males don't like independent and opinionated women, then we start researching on that issue. But on the specific group of Bengali male, we can further uh, narrow down to the, say for example, Bengali Hindu males, uh, maybe Bengali Muslim males, uh, maybe middle class Bengali Hindu males, and other, other, other sort of uh, specific particularizations can be made. But this is particularistic research, not generalizing, not generalized research, generalistic research. Now we have, we come to the uh, fundamental versus applied or fundamental and applied research issue. Uh, that the, if your goal is to, uh, is for, is to gain knowledge for sake, for sake of knowing, then it's a fundamental research. It's, it's basically to further our understanding of the world around us. Doesn't have any immediate application. It doesn't have any immediate application. We don't seek such a knowledge for immediately applying uh, to ameliorate or to better the situation. Doesn't directly solve a problem per se. Say for example, if we do a research, do a, do a research on the association of loneliness and depression. Is it gender specific? Is it age specific? Is it culture specific? Is it occupation or engage, engagement specific? Uh, we do the research not to help the depressed people. We only want to know whether there is any loneliness or depression as far as gender is concerned, age is concerned, culture is concerned, occupation or engage specific is concerned. We don't have the applied aspect in mind. 
Now, fundamental research can be mostly universalistic, but it can be particularistic too. We can narrow down our research uh, to a particular cultural setting or particular thing. Say, for example, uh, if, we if we want to study drug abused, drug abuse among the first offenders. So we can try to relate the first offense or the crime with the drug abuse. So we can actually particularize a fundamental research. This is not to help the drug abuse, neither to the first offenders, but we can have a we can try to have a knowledge on the drug abuse from the among the past offenders. Uh, applied research often particularistic, mostly particularistic, because it has an application in mind. It aimed at solving a problem for a specific group in a specific context. So uh, we take the specific group in a specific context and try to solve a problem can be universalistic too. We can have, uh, uh, we can try to apply a particular thing. Uh, say for example here, changing the types of uh, video games, we change the types of video games and we can try to watch the changes in kid kids behavior, whether they are becoming less aggressive or not. It can be universalistic research. We're changing the violent video games to a more pleasant ones. More specific types of intervention and treat or treatment are there in applied research. Applied research can produce results that lead to new insights, leading to new intervention or treatment, may also provide some fundamental knowledge. Applied research can provide fundamental knowledge and vice versa. Fundamental research can have some applied knowledge. From fundamental research, some applications can really come up. Some, okay, we can create some applications from fundamental research. We can have some fundamental knowledge in the applied research also. Two types of research can reinforce each other and brief recap. We had critical social science, feminist social science, postmodern social science, parting ways, economic psychology and history. We left anthropology and sociology because that's much discussed. Approaches to social science, very briefly, qualitative methods, quantitative method, mixed method. Then we have goals of research, universalistic and particularistic, applied and fundamental. Thank you for Joining. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, I think we have some questions on Zoom as well as on YouTube. So mm -hmm. we decided I will uh, I will read out the questions from Zoom, and uh, Ronjan will uh, read out the questions from YouTube. Well, so, let Ronjan first do that. Okay, let okay. Ronjan do that first. Okay. There is no question till now in YouTube. Mm. Okay. Then Pushkita. Okay. Uh, first, we have a comment from Sri. Also, women are low paid in uh, MG and NREGS scheme. Uh, it's uh, a yeah, statement, I guess. Um, uh, in some sometimes it is, it, has, it, is, it is seen, but uh, it's not. Uh, ingrained or it's not there in the plan itself. I mean, uh, the program doesn't really allow you to pay lower for the women, uh, have, have a lower wage for the women, uh, but uh, um, some systems actually create that they, uh, they um, give lesser wages to women. Part of this uh, wage actually goes to but these days with the kind of DBT, uh, uh, it's less possible. I mean, maybe uh, they just uh, try to carve out some commissions from those. 
Uh, women liver. Yes. Mm. Ranjan uh, stated that I think the payment is same for different family members. Mm. Ah. Okay, next question is mm. from Ankana Kundu. What is nihilism or nihilism? Nihilism basically is the uh, oh, uh, orderliness or disorderliness rather. Uh, and nihilism is actually disorderliness, disorder, disorder, orderliness. It's a separate sort of philosophical, um, what should it philosophical tradition that we can discuss. Uh, but nihilism is uh, basically uh, how we create order in a society, how we perceive order in a society. And our perception may be wrong, but how we perceive order in a society, that's nihilism. Mm. Next question is from Priya. Is not it correct that human generation can't go on without each of the gender, rather male or female, can't uh, sustain without each other? So still, why this concept that male is supreme? Well, um, that's the basic fallacy of world. I mean, uh, we, I mean, nobody, none of the males can survive with the, with the, without females. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, this is the this is the basic thing. But well, uh, uh, since uh, women are not, I mean, it it all started in the um, uh, in the prehistory, should I say? Uh, because women had to uh, women were confined in a home, how or rather shelters, to take care of their children. They were, they started, the males started to subjugate. That's the start. But well, uh, it, it was I mean, not in every societies, but in some societies we found that well, uh, uh, the, the women, women are confined to the household works and the males were uh, from outside. Males were doing the outside works. Uh, but later, later it found that with, with the invention of, the inventions of, uh, different scientific apparatus, say for example, steam engine. We call steam engine is a revolutionary uh, dis discovery, but steam engine was a start of women's subjugation in the modern era. Because women are not supposed to run the steam engine. So the uh, the, um, um, the technology created more discrimination in the society, uh, as far as men and women are concerned, than the prehistory, prehistory um, um, facts. So it's always there. I mean, you can see that in in um, in European languages. Uh, there is no separate term for women. In Bengali, we have Nari, Purush. In Hindi, we have Mad, uh, um, uh, Mahila. Uh, all those things are there. But there is no such term in English. You can, you can find it. So lack of manhood is womanhood. So you can see how deeply entrenched it in the Western culture. Not in the non-Western culture, though. The women were very uh, equal uh, up to certain time in Vedic period also. Uh, so it's a factor that has been there in uh, history. And uh, well, we started to we, we have started to depart from that part of history, but it will take time. Yes, any other question? Yeah. Uh, next from Sri. Sir, why is postmodernism, oh, sorry, why is postmodernism is associated with Kafka's thought? Another is, another question with that. Also, does uh, postmodernism oppose capitalism and beliefs more in socialism or a socialist society? 
I mean, uh, capitalism, postmodern associated, associated with Kafka. Yeah, of course, uh, Kafka is, uh, uh, I mean, um, not, uh, I mean, Kafka, Kafka's metamorphosis, castle, all those things are postmodern in nature. I mean, that's a creation. That's a creation. I mean, uh, Kafka's plague. That's uh, you can when you read it, you will find that uh, uh, such a kind of uh, similarities in this COVID nineteen situation. Uh, so he start. He actually. He was actually a postmodernist in his creation. So Kafka was a uh, uh, postmodernist, I mean, in his literature. There were other people in art, in cinema, um, uh, uh, they, they are postmodernists, not only Kafka. I mean, the postmodernist social science, or postmodernist social science rather, uh, uh, came from the literature, from uh, postmodernist literature, art, and other creations. So it, it was, uh, it, they created first, and then uh, it was, the thought came to the social science. Another question was with that, uh -huh. postmodernism opposed, uh, postmodernism opposed capitalism and believes more in socialism. Or a socialist society? No, 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 no. I mean, they don't believe in any organized ideology. So they don't believe in capitalism. They don't believe in socialism. They believe in nothing. I said that this is a paralyzing relativism. It will paralyze you. So uh, they don't believe it. Okay. Uh, next question from Priya. According to postmodernism, is it is it only the state of society which decides the improvement of world? Does technology has no role in improvement? Well, they say that technology is a chief divider. Uh, so, uh, as far as postmodernism is concerned, uh, they, 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 they detest or rather they despise the technology. They say that this is a, and it also, the, the, some form of feminism also, uh, uh, they, they think that technology creates stratification. Te technology creates oppression. Technology creates subjugation. So, uh, uh, technology, uh, I mean, even, Postmodernists don't consider that uh, one should be liberated. I mean, people can't li liberate from a kind of, from this uh, whole sort of holistic pessimism. One thing they consider holistic is the pessimism. So you are living in a society, and if you want to liberate from that society, you are you have options from other kinds of societies. The other kind of society is socialism. They don't even believe in that. So you will have to live within this society and you will have to die within this society, taking its perils, taking its uh, ill effects into your mind and body. That's important. They don't believe in any organized forms of uh, belief system or any ideology for that. Not even any social science theory. Hmm. Another question uh, from Priya. Does the theoretical concept to make the people of the society li uh, liberate works for real in every society? Does the theoretical, theoretical concept to make the people of the society liberate, liberate uh, works for uh, real in every society? I mean, if I understand it, understood it correctly, then you are talking about whether we have any effect of the theoretical concept uh, 
towards time towards emancipation well um, uh, i mean uh, the, it's a kind of conflicting view what uh, i mean whether we can create a social theory that can liberate people marxists say yes we can uh, interpretive interpretivist or other uh, groups of society other groups people say no we can't positivists say yes we can uh, at least we can uh, through positivism we can actually explain what 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 liberation is positivistically and uh, how can how we can deal with the liberation uh, but well uh, uh, i mean these theories are there whether uh soviet union or the leftist or the uh, uh countries were liberated um, uh, with this uh, uh, theory is the, are also the also there in the history uh, you can judge it yourself um it's there it's there in the um, uh, it's there for um uh, and the jury is out i mean i should say jury is out um to uh, consider whether social theory can make uh, people or society people or society liberate but some theories have some liberation effect should i say um in the history but well that shortly uh, history i mean societies went back to Uh, the same subjugation mode not same the different subjugation mode uh, or oppressive mode over and over again yes next question from sri what does hegelian dialectical mean oh. hegelian dialectic is is a, is a reverse i mean uh, it's a uh, huge issue it's a reverse of uh, marxist dialectics it doesn't Uh, i mean uh, it's a kind of idealistic form of um, uh, uh, dialectic thought where you have the synthesis first then you create i mean uh, then you create the thesis and antithesis so they say that marx actually inverted a hegelian dialectic um, and um, uh, and started moving the hegelian dialectic in a materialistic way synthesis and antithesis synthesis this is antithesis and synthesis it's a very briefly it's a over simplification of hegelian dialectic it's a, uh, i mean um, it's a separate discussion that we can do uh, but this is briefly what the hegel hegelians believe they don't believe that the thesis synthesis thesis and antithesis happen initially they, they believe that synthesis that is the uh, that is a given that is that is a given world is there and we must search the reason of this given world in terms of thesis and antithesis yes another question from sri what role does emil durkheim play in development of psychology is it more inclined towards positivist approach or individual approach I talked about Emil. First thing is that I, I don't know anything that Emil Durkheim has done for psychology. Uh, secondly, uh, when I talked about Emil Durkheim briefly, I said that it's it's a it's a trend that emanates from positivistic uh, social positive positivism, which talked about which um, which argued that social science should be more fact finding. So his social fact was. uh was a result of positivism it's a trend within a trend emanated from positivism another question is that does history has similar approach as middle range theory i was there thought rather than events as an outsider history has similar approach as middle range theory yes of course i mean the, the, the looking the past has uh, of course middle range theory uh, we we all, always uh, uh, some we sometimes uh, apply middle range theory in the theory of past i mean when you are 
judging the past, you don't have the um, specialization, whether an archaeologist or historian. Uh, middle East theory is applied. Middle East theory is applied uh, in um, uh, history and uh, is to, to, to judge the past rather. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, uh, from history can be, uh, I mean, the, 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 the basic um, postulation of history is to judge from outside. But well, I have discussed about four uh, uh, history, four, 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 four uh, variants of um, uh, history that is there in, in recent uh, past or recent, uh, recently uh, that judge from within, of course. I mean, it's a judge, it's a judgment from within. Another question from Priya. What is the outcome of history in the present society? Outcome? Or role, I can say. Role. Of course, I mean, uh, I mean, it, it depends on how you see the present society. Whether you are seeing the present society in a diachronic way, historical way, it has a huge, huge uh, sort of significance in present society. History has got a huge significance in present society. But you are, uh, if you are seeing it in a postmodern way, history has nothing to do with present society. It depends on how you see the society. Another question from Priya. Can this history of mentality lead to collision between individuals or society, societies? Well, the, the, the collision between uh, the uh, between uh, individual and societies is there. I mean, it's always there. In our life is always there. Do we actually accept the society, whatever it does? No, we don't accept that. I mean, the collision is there in our life all the time, almost all the time. So, uh, not only the uh, imagine, imagine, imaginaire, uh, but also in real life situation, you can find this collision. But well, of course, I mean, when we uh, talk about, when, when I was uh, discussing the Mangal Sutra uh, issue uh, in reification, you can find that simple analysis, if you, if you, if you Want to analyze this uh, this in the light of imaginaire uh, that is imagined? You'll find that there can be a collision um, uh, between individual and a society if if one married lady actually uh, doesn't um, wear uh, that doesn't hold that kind of imaginaire that doesn't uh, wear the Mangal Sutra. So it, it is always there. I mean, we, with Mangal Sutra, that's a kind of imaginaire. Without Mangal Sutra, there's a, there's a kind of imaginaire. So they are, I mean, it's always there. Yes. Another uh, statement from Sri, I think. I think when our society shifted from horticulturist society to agriculturist society, there had been a rise in suppression of women or uh, undermining women, so to say. Uh, look, I mean, I uh, uh, first thing is that uh, I don't believe in the kind of universalistic sort of uh, evolutionism. But the least I can say about it is that, well, of course, I mean, um, the recognition of women labor I was talking about the NRDGS scheme. Recognition of human labor uh, uh, was almost always it was, uh, we least recognize women labor. Even in our daily life, we least recognize women labor. And since the time when we are for, for ages, we don't, even the very term hunter-gatherer is, uh, insensitive, gender insensitive. Hunting was uh, not a regular job. 
um, they don't they they didn't get uh, good games every time so gathering was the uh, was the uh, main thing or was the main activity through which they survived the gathering gathering was predominantly done by the women but we even when we we never say that it's a gathering hunting society we put maximum credit to hunting you can see how we uh, denigrated or rather avoided to recognize women labor so it was there throughout the history but it was not there universalistic it is not universalistic throughout the world we can't say that we can't say that every society was like that it's a it's a kind of universalistic uh, view that cannot be proved everywhere yes another question from ankana can we say at the end of day all our acts like creating history of our imaginary ideas behaving good or bad to someone etc are influenced by our individual psychology or it is influenced by a whole treatment from a particular society it is both it is both i mean um, uh, how you dress how you uh, talk how you behave uh, both your individual psychology and the the kind of uh, bringing up or rather kind of society that are living in that's a that's a result of that society the society societal uh forces that is that you are in so it's both next question uh, or statement i think from rishab balo how is the impact of the Mahat uh, manhattan project about the atomic bomb and how humanity's desire to move to a type 1 civilization or colonizing space on modernity and post modernity respectively how is the impact of manhattan project about the atomic bomb and humanity's desire to move the type one civilization colonize space on modernity and post modernity respectively well, i mean the it's a kind of open ended question i say that the it's a very big debate whether the atom bomb was needed or whether hiroshima nagasaki nagasaki was needed that's one thing it was needed for american american expansionism uh not to defeat uh, the axis force nazi force sorry no 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 nazi force because um, uh, they were all they were already confined to a small area that's history for you uh and of course uh, there was a threat from uh, ussr us for ussr to capture the entire europe that they can capture the entire europe uh that's one thing but uh type 1 civilization or the european forms of western civilization rather uh it is uh, i mean it is act to move to taiha or colonizing space uh, i mean atom bomb uh, actually created the difference uh in the world in us domination in uh, i mean us started to dominate after uh, the atom bomb situation hiroshima nagasaki nagasaki uh but it was not entirely unipolar world um uh, the 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 socialist world was also there uh, i mean it it created a division though but uh, uh it created i mean at the same time 
war as well as the atom bomb uh, created a decolonization movement. All the Westward colonies uh, were left by the British uh, imperialists, uh, and then uh, by the other colonial colonial forces like Portuguese, the, the French, Dutch. So uh, it was a landmark situation, though. But uh, how to relate with modernity and postmodernity? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, modernity, uh, the, the modern architecture and other things developed. Uh, but uh, well, postmodernity, postmodern dis description of atom bomb can be very uh, pessimistic, more pessimistic than uh, than we ever think. I think I could answer your question, but I could not answer your. Um, I could not fully understand your question. Also. Yes. Any other question? No, sir. We don't have any question on Zoom. I think uh, we have maybe on YouTube. I would. I would like to request Ronjon to read out. Ronjon, please. No, sir. There are no question in the YouTube comment box. There is no question. So let uh, let us thank um, all the participants uh, who uh, who uh, who could actually stay with me with us uh, till the end and who could not stay. Uh, uh, I I would like to thank all of you and I would particularly thank all of you for your contribution. Uh, we have transferred the amount, uh, adding our own amounts uh, to a very uh, very good very um, uh, very famous um, uh, NGO, Tagore Society of Rural Development, who are doing very good work in, in Sundarbans. Um, we have uh, transferred that amount. And I would like to thank all of you for your small, small contribution. We could make, uh, so we could give something to these people who, who desperately needs, need uh, some help. Uh, thank you once again. And uh, we hope to meet again in some other lecture series. Uh, we will uh, talk, we will we'll get the um, feedback from, the, from our participants. And uh, we'll, uh, you can, you can, um, uh, you, can um, uh, you can give your feedback. Uh, we'll, we'll soon give you the link for the feedback. And you can also feel feedback in the WhatsApp and feedback on how, whether uh, you could have any uh, benefits of this lecture series. Uh, if, if, uh, if the people can benefit it, if we can, we can be benefited, then we can continue this lecture series with some other topic. And what kind of topic that we can take up will also be decided by um, uh, by the by, Kolkata Study Group as a so Kolkata uh, Study Circle as uh, as a whole. We will make a poll um, in this uh, in the in the WhatsApp group and please join us once again for uh, if we can arrange another study circle, another lecture series for you. Thank you, thank you for. Sir, uh, I think another questions we have from Bitan. Uh, aren't, we, aren't, aren't, aren't we originated uh, from uh, animal world where the superiority depends on the dominant sex uh, of a specific species? So doesn't it appear that the oppression on women is simply due to animalistic background once we belong, but uh, with the complexity of mind have changed the uh, scenario till that? Well, uh, that's once again a very debatable issue. Whether we got uh, a kind of animal instinct in our anti-woman uh, mindset is a very debatable issue. Uh, some people seem to suggest that, but well, uh, I have um, I know very many animals uh, who are living in a group are egalitarian in nature. And of course, those animals who live in solidarity, 
I am, I'm, I will live so solid in a solid, who lead solid life, solid, so, solid, uh, not uh, solid, I mean, uh, live alone, uh, not in groups. They also have, uh, these animals also have uh, kind of equal, uh, equal um, entitlement for the women. Uh, it's a very debatable issue, but uh, I, for the, for, I don't think uh, the, 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 the little that I know about uh, human history of human evolution, uh, I don't think it, uh, we, we really get, got it from animals. Animals are much better than us, um, and it has been proved time and again. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I must say that it was uh, the relations of production from in Marxist terms. I'm I'm sorry to use this term. Uh, I can't find any other uh, good uh, connotation to uh, dis describe this. Uh, the, the relations of production when the, when the human uh, sorry woman uh, subjugation started with the changing relations of production. It was least during the uh, food um, uh, gathering stage. Uh, later, uh, as we move on to a, a better or rather more uh, energy producing um, uh, production techniques, uh, we can really, we, uh, uh, we started to subjugate women more. It was at its peak when we uh, we started village farming, sedentary lifestyle. So uh, I uh, I think it, it is something to do with the uh, technology and relations of production. That's my view. Yes, but in many animal kingdoms, uh, sexual yes, completely. Uh, somebody else uh, have answered. Uh, has answered this question, but in many animal kingdoms, the sexual part is generally dominated by females. Yes, that's 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 true. That's very much true. Okay, thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, wonderful lecture series. And I think uh, those who have not uh, joined our WhatsApp group, they can email us their uh, feedback. Uh, so it will be better to know from them their feedbacks so all of you can email us you i think you you all of you have our email address so any of you can email us those who have not joined our whatsapp group thanks for participating and thanks for supporting us thank you thank you thank you sir. thank good you good night good night